848 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, today we are covering Leviticus chapters 14 and 15, another fun one, I tell you. And I will warn you, because I know there are some of you who watch with your littles, there may be some mature minds that are needed to digest today's word. So I just want to give you a heads up, especially for chapter 15. So if you want to maybe save this one for another day, or maybe you want to allow your children to go do something else, or if you have the kind of relationship where you can discuss these things openly, then obviously you have the freedom to do so. But I just want to be able to let you know that. And reminder, we are reading out of the ESV by Crossway translation today. Otherwise, if you could please help us out before we get started by hitting that like button so that you say, I'm here, ready to get into the word. I love the book of Leviticus. I'm telling myself that I'm believing in that. And I'm going to have a new perspective today as we read through some of these things. So before we do that, let's go ahead and pray and prepare our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father, we so need you today, oh Holy Spirit, to guide our reading, to guide our thoughts, to be able to to guide this wisdom, to allow it to get down into our hearts, into our souls, into our spirits in the way that you intended for it to be. I pray that you'll give our eyes, our ears, and our minds clarity today to be able to see this word for what it was meant to be for us. You wrote it for the Israelites, Lord, for a purpose, but its purpose is served even today. And so I pray that we will be able to hear your voice through it. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies that are new this morning. I pray, Lord, that we will live every single day as if it is the eighth day, a new beginning. We also ask that you'll forgive us of our sins, Lord. Clear out anything that might be hindering our ability to have complete fellowship with you. We love you so much, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we read in yesterday's reading all about leprosy. That was a fun one. And well, today we are getting the laws on the cleansing of the lepers and being able to integrate them back into community. Now, verses one through seven, keep your eyes out for Jesus because this does paint a picture of him. Verse one, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out from the camp and the priest shall look. So I already love that the priest is going to the sick person the same way that Jesus left heaven to come down to us sick people. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed. So notice there's a difference between the healing and the cleansing. They're already healed, but now they have to be cleansed spiritually to be able to worship again, two live clean birds, cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. Now, all of these things are associated with Jesus, of course. One, because Jesus took on the frailty of humanity. So you can think of that as the fragility of a bird, the cedar wood representing the cross, the scarlet representing his blood. And of course, we know the hyssop was the branch that the sponge and the vinegar was attached to whenever they tried to feed it to Jesus on the cross. And it also speaks of sacrifice. So continue in verse five, and the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in the earthenware vessel over fresh water. So this fresh water would have referred to running or living water that would come from a stream. So it would not have been anything sitting in a spring or a cistern. And again, if we look at that, Jesus being the first bird who died according to prophecy, which of course, water being symbolic of the word. So he is that first bird that fulfilled that prophecy. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. So this blood would represent the death that this person escaped. So this blood would represent the death that this person has just escaped. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. So this, of course, is a picture of Jesus ascending into heaven with his blood, because the Bible says in Hebrews 9 that he actually took his blood and sprinkled it in heaven on the altar. Or we can even look at this second bird as us, those who are dipped in the blood of Christ and set free. But letting the living bird go would be symbolic of them taking away the uncleanness from the camp. Verse 8, and he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water and he shall be clean. 
So the process of washing and shaving would be repeated twice after seven days, marking the completion of the cleansing process. Now, the shaving actually held both practical and spiritual purposes. It would not only descale them of any residual disease that might be on the skin, but it would also give them the appearance of being, quote, reborn. So for us, this can actually imply the moment of our rebirth and the need to repeat the process of washing over and over again. Because whenever we are first saved, there is such a purity and a sincerity in our desire to know Christ. But over time, as we mature, that newness can sometimes wear off, and we can think that our maturity gives us this right to now go around and scold everybody. But to me, I see a picture of a toddler when that happens, who just begins to talk, and they kind of mimic their parents as they teach their stuffed animals. And it's really cute, but it's ineffective, and it's a false sense of maturity. So we have to constantly shave that off of ourselves so that we can always remain hungry and eager for His Word and His wisdom. And whenever we do that, the most simple of Scripture will begin to take on new life every single time you read it. So heart check, are you still eager and hungry for the Word? Or have you developed a false sense of spirituality that needs to be shaved down? And after that, he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day, he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard and his eyebrows. He shall shave off all his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day, so again, the eighth day representing the new beginning, he shall take two male lambs without blemish and one ewe lamb, a year old without blemish and a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and one log of oil. Well, that's new. A log is a three fifth of a pint. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So Jesus, of course, as our high priest, both cleanses us and presents us as holy before the Father. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering, along with the log of oil, and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary. So this happening inside the holy place. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it on into the palm of his own left hand, and dip its right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand, the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed now what's interesting here is that the only people who were anointed on the head with oil would have been kings prophets priests and lepers which goes to show that god can restore and anoint anybody. And notice that the blood needed to be applied before the oil. So the implication here is that the Holy Spirit cannot be applied to an area that has not been touched by the blood. So if we are seeking to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, there has to be a cleansing from sin first. It has to take place. And there are a lot of people who are seeking to be filled by the Spirit when the Lord is saying, I need you to empty yourself out first because there's no room for me to dwell. So heart check. Are you seeking an anointing before emptying yourself out? What areas of your life need to be touched by the blood? Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterward, he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus, the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. So again, these burnt offerings would have to be offered because of the fact that this person has been away from the temple, has not been offering his sacrifices as prescribed. But if he is poor and cannot afford so much, then he shall take one one male lamb for a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for for him and a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with the oil for a grain offering and a log of oil 
Also two turtle doves or two pigeons, whichever he can afford. And I love that, that God always makes a way. No matter what their economic status is, he will make a way for people to be able to come. The one shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. And on the eighth day, he shall bring them for his cleansing to the priest, to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering and the log of the oil, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb of the guilt offering. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall put some of the oil into the palm of his left hand and shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. And the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot in the place where the blood of the guilt offering was put. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer of the two turtle doves or pigeons, whichever he can afford, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, along with a grain offering, and the priest shall make Make atonement before the Lord for him who is being cleansed. This is the law for him in whom is a case of leprous disease, who cannot afford the offerings for his cleansing. And now as we look at the laws for cleansing houses from mildew or mold, keep in mind that our bodies and our hearts are the home of Christ. This is where Christ dwells, our Holy Spirit dwells. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession, then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, there seems to me to be some case of disease in my house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes to examine the disease, lest all that is in the house be declared unclean. So there has to be radical change that takes place. And afterward, the priest shall go in to see the house and he shall examine the disease. And if the disease is in the walls of the house with greenish or reddish spots, and if it appears to be deeper than the surface, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look. If the disease has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take out of the stones in which the disease and throw them into an unclean place outside of the city. And why do they have to do this? Because one stone can infect the entire house and he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around and the plaster that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones and he shall take other plaster and plaster the house. So while this section is speaking practically about clearing out the mildew or the mold from a home, there are many spiritual lessons to be learned here. So we already know that one stone of sin will not only affect our entire being, but it will affect our entire household. And this is why those stones have to be removed and tossed outside the camp. But we are also likened to living stones of a spiritual house. We are the bricks of the church, and we are responsible for the health of it. So if we see a stone that is sick or leprous, there are biblical ways to deal with it. And that does not include gossiping, judging, or tearing it down. We must be people who deal with them directly and privately and with grace. And when we properly clean house, it invites others to want to enter in. But if we are just sweeping things under the rug, eventually all of that dirt is going to accumulate and pile up. And eventually there will be a hot mess that you'll have to clean up. So heart check. Is there a stone in your life that you need to deal with either privately or corporately? Verse 43, and if the disease breaks out again in the house after he has taken out the stones and scraped the house and plastered it, then the priest shall go and look. And if the disease has spread in the house, it is a persistent leprous disease in the house and it is unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones and timber and all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them out of the city to an unclean place. So this, if we are looking at it spiritually, whenever we do deal biblically with someone in the church, we first go to them privately. If they don't listen, then you go with two or three witnesses. And then if they don't listen again, that's when you deal with them publicly. And eventually they may have to be actually kicked out because they are going to do more harm in the church than the harm that will be done to them 
in the removal process. And we'll learn more about that in the New Testament. But if the priest comes and looks, and if the disease has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean for the disease is healed. And for the cleansing of the house, he shall take two small birds with cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop and shall kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water and shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn along with the live bird and dip them in the blood of the bird that was killed and in the fresh water and sprinkle the house seven times. Thus he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the fresh water and with the live bird and with the cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn. And he shall let the live bird go out of the city into the open country. So he shall make atonement for the house and it shall be clean. This is the law for any case of leprous disease for an itch, for leprous disease in a garment or in a house, and for a swelling or an eruption or a spot to show when it is unclean and when it is clean. This is the law for a leprous disease. So again, the whole purpose of this law is to be able to allow them to determine what is clean and unclean, but also to be able to teach others what is clean and unclean. Chapter 15. Here we go. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any man has a discharge from his body. So let's just stop here on this. Discharge would mean an abnormal flow of discharge and his body literally translated to flesh, but it is referring to the male sexual organ. So this is talking about probably an STD and most likely something like gonorrhea. Then his discharge is unclean. And this is the law of his uncleanness for a discharge. Whether his body runs with his discharge or his body is blocked up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed on which the one with the discharge lies shall be unclean, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever sits on anything on which the one with the discharge has sat shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches the body of the one with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if the one with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And any saddle on which the one with the discharge rides shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries such things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Anyone whom the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And an earthenware vessel that the one with the discharge touches shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed with water. Verse 13, and when the one with a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes and he shall bathe his body in fresh water and shall be clean. And on the eighth day, he shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. And notice that this is the cheaper of the payment. They're not required to bring a ram or a bull and the priest shall use them one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. Now, if a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until the evening. And every garment and every skin on which the semen comes shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. If a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. So we must note that this is not a condemnation of sex. You know, we have to remember that God created sex for marriage as a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Not only that, its purpose would serve to preserve the race and the covenant that God made with his people. But just like any good gift, even sex can be tainted. And my view of sex was so warped because of the things that I saw and experienced growing up. And because this is one of the strongest carnal urges we have as human beings, we will often Often separate it from our spirituality as if it is something that we can hide from God. But remember, He designed us, He created this, and it is intertwined with our spirit. So, our sexuality is a major factor in our spiritual walk. So, heart check Does your sexuality honor or dishonor God? Now, when a woman has a discharge and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days. So again, this is not considered sin. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. 
And everything on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whether it is the bed or anything on which she sits, try to say that fast, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lies with her and her menstrual impurity comes upon him, he shall be unclean seven days and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Now, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. And again, this would be because she would have been away from the temple for an extended amount of time. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. So this is the main focus, is making sure that the tabernacle remains holy and undefiled. This is the law for him. God is not being cruel here. He is not trying to separate people. He is not trying to make people be detestable to others. He is doing this for the good of of everyone. And so this was so that they could have a place to come and worship. This is the law for him who has a discharge and for him who has an emission of semen becoming unclean thereby. Also for her who is unwell with her menstrual impurity, that is, for anyone male or female who has a discharge and for the man who lies with a woman who is unclean. Whew. Aren't you so glad that we do not have to be consumed by these rituals and these regulations? I mean, Jesus actually criticized the Pharisees who overemphasize ceremonial cleanliness. But where we have to be careful is not swinging so far to the other side where we think that because we have been shown grace in the midst of our uncleanness or because we have been told that we will be forgiven of every sin, that we can now somehow live so freely that we live loosely and we pay no mind to the purity of our hearts. You see, prior to the 1800s, doctors would actually perform autopsies, and then they would go work on patients shortly after. And they were finding that there was an alarming rate of deaths among their patients. And what they later found is that these doctors were actually the ones spreading the disease from the deceased to the patients because they weren't washing up in between procedures. This is why we see strict sterilization practices in the medical field today, because they know that continual cleansing is necessary. So heart check, have you taken a spiritual shower lately? Are you continually looking for the areas that need to be cleansed? And as hard as these chapters can be to get through, the heartbeat that I love the most here is that God is the God of second chances. We are all living in our second chance right now a life that is in the process of being restored and perfected from glory to glory. So let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. How is the dealing with physical impurity related to our dealing with spiritual impurity? Which appears to be taken more seriously in society? Can you see the role of the high priest in your life through Christ? What does God's provision for the poor say about his character? How can these ancient laws be applied in modern day regarding cleanliness and health? And do you see a correlation between sexuality and spirituality? So we thank you, Lord, for your commitment to our restoration and our purification. We are so grateful that no matter how badly we have been infected, you make a way to find us in our isolation and heal us from within. It doesn't matter how rich or poor we are, you make a way for us. So we thank you for that compassion that is so evident in today's reading. 
We are so grateful that you have healed us and pulled us out of the things that were literally killing us. I pray that you will continually wash us by your blood. Everything that we hear, everything that we do, and every place we go, I pray that it will be covered. For we know that before we can walk in our anointing, your blood must have touched it first. And as we continue to seek you, I pray that you will expose what might be lurking underneath so that we can properly deal with it. May we never become so desensitized to the scales that still remain. I pray that we will always remain in a newborn state of humility so that we are always hungering after your word as if it is the first time that we are hearing it. So we thank you for being a God of the second, the third, even the fourth and infinity chances. Thank you for the new opportunities each day and every day to renew our minds and our spirits. I pray that we will be constantly aware of any stone that is out of place or any mold that has begun to fester so that we can ensure that our foundation does not crumble or need to be condemned. May we always keep our homes as a clean dwelling place for you. And I pray that we also keep our bodies holy and submitted to you, always recognizing that they are a gift that you have designed to house our spirit and soul while we are here on this earth. We can't separate our sexuality from our spirituality, for it is all a part of your grand design. So help us not to warp the idea of sex and what you created it for. I pray that our sexuality will be as honoring to you as we see it for what it is. Where there has been defilement, oh God, will you ask for your forgiveness and for a restoration of our bodies and the way that we view them. Help us to steward the gift of sex in our bodies well. I pray for healing among those who have experienced any kind of disease or defilement related to it. And we declare a supernatural healing and freedom from those things. We thank you for that freedom today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.